Hello students and welcome to week eight, our final week in which we wanted to, in place of our Monday night session, wrap up our course looking at our final theme called Serve the World. Remember, we've looked at cherish character, challenge culture, and we're not going to spend as much time, but it's certainly an important thematic approach, and that is serving the world. What I want us to do in this session is just provide a couple of different approaches to our personal availability to God to be used as vice regents, uh, co-workers with him in the world in his kingdom work and vision, and to see the posture or attitude of servanthood that we have been called to in this particular role. So as we say, God's will and serving the world. What we wanna do is to really pose the question, how do we know God's will? When is it that we really know that we have discovered what it is, our vocation, our voca? Remember us talking about that last week in session, second, session seven uh, last week? Uh, what is our calling? And I'm going to contrast a couple of uh, authors' approaches. These weren't required readings. They weren't available to you. But I think these are, are great insights into the counterbalance that they provide to one another in the call that God is making on us to serve the world um, and how we can actually look at our own place in the world in this season. I want to call on two different rather well-known and accomplished authors and uh, spiritual leadership and uh, church leadership experts. One of them is named David Platt. Um, he serves a church in the Atlanta, Georgia area and uh, has written a book called Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. It's a great read. If you ever have time, I think you would benefit from the entire book that, he writ that he's written. The other who presents a response to what Platt is going to argue, and we'll get into that in just a moment, is named Michael Horton. He's written a book titled Ordinary. To see, see the two, radical, ordinary, kind of the dialogue going on. Sustainable Faith in a Radical, Restless World. And they're both posing the same question, maybe in different ways or verbiage, but they're the same question they're attempting to answer. And that is, what kind of life does Jesus call us to as we read scripture, as his followers, his disciples, as uh, vice regents, if we continue that, that uh, thematic approach that we've used, uh, that metaphor as uh, a royal priesthood. We talked about that way back at the beginning of the course. What kind of life does Jesus call us to do uh, as his disciples? Can we discover that in, in scripture? Here's the one approach that David Platt has taken. I'm summarizing. He argues that we as the American church, we've become way too comfortable and we've been lulled into an unbiblical vision of Christianity. Now, I'm not asking you to agree or disagree at this point. I'm just sharing with you the paradigm or perspective that Platt, that Platt uh, offers. He says this, verse 18 of his book, Here we stand amid an American dream dominated by self-advancement, self-esteem, and self-sufficiency by individualism and materialism. When we hear Jesus saying, and he's going to write about this in his book from Mark chapter 10, the call that he makes on his followers, particularly to the one that we refer to as the rich young ruler uh, in Mark chapter 10 and, and other parallel passages, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, he told this man who was seeking eternal life, and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me. Well, that does sound radical, particularly when you consider, as Platt puts it, this American dream dominated by self-advancement, self-esteem, and self-sufficiency, individualism, and materialism. Now, again, you may agree or disagree, but I'm wanting us to see this particular perspective. Here's something else that Jesus said. Anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. 
any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. There was a radical call that Jesus made to Simon and, and Andrew in following him. Um, so we need to ask the question, Platt argues, what is it do we really value? What is our true treasure? Is it, as he puts it, let me go in the proper direction here, self-advancement, self-esteem, self-sufficiency, individualism and materialism, that can sound a lot like the American church sometimes, can't it? Or is Jesus saying, if you're going to come follow me, then it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you, perhaps, your comfort and your reputation and the security that material possessions and accomplishment bring you, or a good name among your uh, co-workers, and climbing the corporate ladder, and, and all of those kinds of things that go with what we call the American dream. A Platt is going to argue in his book Radical that the call that Jesus is making in these passages and others to his original disciples, and then by in perpetuity, us, as we read the scripture, remember, uh, we studied earlier that the scripture was written to them and for us. His claim, uh, Platt's claim is that to be radical means to live a life of radical abandonment. Are we willing to go that far? And of course, Platt's going to argue, his premise is going to be that one reason that the American church is struggling so and starting to become so unhealthy and uh, we've declined in growth rather than uh, advanced in growth and that we're becoming more like the culture than we are influencing the culture around us is that we've not completely sold out to Christ, that we're not following this radical call uh, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and and follow him. Now, Michael Horton, the other author that I referred to here, has written a book uh, in response to the premise that Platt uh, is arguing from in his book. He says on page 11 of his book, Ordinary, we become accustomed to looking around restlessly for something new the latest and greatest, that idea or product or person or experience that will solve our problems, give us some purpose and change the world. And so uh, what Horton's going to respond to Platt in is, you know what, it could well be that you're overlooking that the restlessness that we're experiencing and the challenges that we're experiencing in the community, the body of Christ, from a countercultural perspective, an evangelistic perspective, uh, a life of holiness perspective, is that it's not that we've lost the gospel message as much as we have not been focused on who we've actually been called to become in Jesus Christ, that we're constantly restless, right? And so we're looking for this new approach and this new idea or product, or maybe this new leader that comes along and that will make life better in the church and make us more sound and, and uh, uh, evangelistically effective and more radical in our holiness and, and all of these kinds of things. And Horton argues, much like uh, Tisha Warren does, uh, Tisha Harrison Warren, this is another statement alike. Uh, he quotes her in the book, Ordinary. She says, we were challenged to impact and serve the world in radical ways, but we never learned how to be an average person living an average life in a beautiful way. I want you to think about that for a moment. Is the only way that we're able to serve Jesus the way of, um, of Platt? Uh, and the idea that in order to be a true disciple, we have to sell everything, either literally or figuratively, 
that we can't be engaged in culture at all, that we have to be totally devoted in a countercultural way to doing nothing but evangelizing and nothing but living in an opposite way of the culture and, and denying ourselves any inclusion in culture at all, that everything that we do in Christianity and discipleship is on the, the living edge, that uh, uh, we're always in this place of danger and and this place of risk and in this place of sensational uh, understandings or experiences of Christianity that we're kind of living on this uh, spiritual revolution high, and that's all that, that, that it is at times, which is what makes Horton reply that we're kind of, we're, we're, we're tossed about looking for something, the next big thing that will satisfy us and settle us when both Horton and Warren, quoted by Horton, argue that there is tremendous power in living, by contrast to being radical, a rather ordinary life. One that in the only, in the way that people think about being truly sold out for Jesus, we sell everything we have, we go to a foreign country and just, we spend the rest of our lives living at risk and in danger evangelizing the heathens, right? But the ordinary nature of life is more likely what most of us experience. And it's more likely what God has called us to live a transformational kind of life in what could be seen as the mundane, the routine, maybe the humdrum or even boring, but it's no less necessary because it honors Jesus where we are. I like this statement. We've never learned to be an average person living an average life in a beautiful way. Have you ever noticed that when it comes to sharing your testimony, for example, or telling your story? Have you noticed that there seem to be those people who have been converted to Christ that just have this compelling uh, dark to light experience, lostness to salvation. They were living on the edge and, and everything about their life was lived with reckless abandon to the point that they were in danger all the time. Now, it was their own self-absorption. It was their own bad decisions. It was their own living of their own lives with their own wisdom, the God's wisdom that put them in such extreme places. But when they were converted, they went from night to day to being this sold out disciple, now completely holy. And they've got this They've got this very compelling story uh, about the, the extreme sinner that they once were. When most of us, we experience fallenness, we certainly rebel against Christ, we disobey the will of God, but we don't do it in such radical, risky, outlandish ways that puts us out on the edge and so when we came to the knowledge of the grace of God, when we come to understand the gospel of Christ and what God's doing for us through him in saving us from our sins and, and, and transforming us into this, uh, this new person again who is reformed in his image, we don't have a dramatic story of going from darkness to light, from going from radical sin to radical holiness. In fact, would you agree that many of our stories, particularly if we've been raised in the influence of the gospel in the community of faith, the church, has been one that, not that we would diminish the, the sincerity or the uh, uh, authenticity, the accuracy of our conversion, if we use that word, but it wouldn't be so much the word conversion that could be used to describe us. It would be more the word uh, commitment that we're making on our own to Christ. And so the, the day after we have committed our lives to Christ doesn't look that much different than the day of or the day before. The transactional nature of the gospel uh, is not that we go from being this radical Saul who was living in rebellion to God or this uh, legion who was filled with so many demons, he had to live outside from the rest of community in Mark chapter five and being so dangerous, right? Or the story of Mary Magdalene, uh, this woman who lived a very bad sinful life, now turning to the gospel and living this life of holiness 
and this life of devotion to Christ, most of us don't have that story to tell. And the argument that Horton is making is, and Tish Harrison Warren helps him make that argument, argument is that there's tremendous power, there's tremendous beauty in living as an average person, an average life that's still committed to following Jesus Christ and allowing the Spirit to guide us and make us over into who God wants us to be and through whom God intends to work to do to do his will. So the question is, how do we live a life of radical abandonment here and now where we are? Are all of us called to leave our home and go to the mission field? To sell everything and come follow Jesus in the literal sense? Or is it more out of the ordinary that we are called? Tish Harrison Warren continues, she says, I suspect, and she's speaking for herself, maybe you can relate. I suspect that for me, getting up and doing the dishes when I'm short on sleep and patience is far more costly and necessitates more of a revolution in my heart than some outwardly risky ways I've lived in the past. And so this is what I need now the courage to face an ordinary day, an afternoon with a colicky baby where I'm probably going to snap at my two-year-old, she says, and get annoyed with my noisy neighbor. Without despair, the bravery it takes to believe that a small life is still a meaningful life, and the grace to know that even when I've done nothing that is powerful or bold or even interesting, that the Lord notices me, and is fond of me, and that that is enough. That's a powerful statement about ordinary, right? And would you agree that many of us, if not most of us, probably live life more like Tish Warren does than the call that uh, Platt is making uh, on our lives? although the role that those that are called to that kind of abandonment is certainly from God and should be respected and adhered to when it comes. It's simply that most of us are not in such a spot. So I come back to Michael Horton, who says, we've forgotten that God showers his extraordinary gifts through ordinary means of grace loves us through ordinary fellow image bearers and sends us out into the world to love and serve others in ordinary callings. So we come to a little crossroads and if we were together on Monday night in, in discussion groups, we could discuss this. We're not in that spot, but I would like for you to ponder it. Uh, David Platt versus Michael Horton. Radical versus ordinary? Is it either or? Or could it be both and? In other words, is there something legitimate about the point that Platt is making that unfortunately far too many forms of our personal Christianity and that in our church communities has been formed by an Americanized approach to Christianity that is much more self-centered and self-serving than maybe we want to admit. And as a result, we become much more in the line of a consumer Christian, that if life goes well and we experience God's blessings, that's what we want to need. All we know we need are sins forgiven, but the God of grace appeals to us far more than the God who demands holiness from us, right? And will accept no less than full devotion to him. Is it that and only that, or is it that we live a humdrum life by comparison to this radical call that we're describing, and that uh, it's not really going to be that much different than what we were experiencing before we committed ourselves to Christ, other than we had our sins forgiven, and now we're called his followers. 
is it either or or can it be both and that the call that's being placed upon us when jesus says anyone who would come after me and be my disciple must first deny himself take up his cross and follow me there is a certain self-abandonment that's involved in that and we have to address it we can't continue on lines in the lines of thinking of consumer christianity what's best here for me you know much like going to the golden corral and the 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 large cafeteria buffet that is there oh give me a uh, a double portion of God's grace and love and mercy and his goodness and his generosity, but hold all of that suffering, hold that, that recrimination that I might end up getting if people knew that I was a Christian. Or, or uh, no, I'm not into that self-denial. I still want to indulge myself in the things that, that I enjoy, but I still want God's grace. I still want forgiveness. I still want to be called his son and daughter. I still want to be uh, considered a Christian, right? Though there is a radical call that he's making on us. And for most of us, must, most of us, it's not going to take us outside the neighborhood, usually where we live. Now, for some it will. For most of us, it's not going to require a change of occupation. For some it will. For many of us, it's not going to change major habits and certainly character traits that we possess. But for some of us, it will. But the decision that we have to make is, are we willing to deny ourselves in order to truly follow Christ? And that's what Platt's arguing. But could it also be true that at the same time that there is that radical call in our lives that for most of us, it's going to look rather ordinary? Oh, it's no less the grand life of God through which God will work to do his, his, his will and from which we will see tremendous change and benefit in how we think, what we value, and therefore how we live. But that there's going to be a sameness about life and that it's okay for us. Not only is it okay, but it could well be our calling that our discipleship is going to be lived out, taking care of our children, doing the dishes, modeling Christ before our children and with our spouse, being good neighbors to those in our neighborhood and just doing right by our fellow human beings, loving our neighbors as ourselves, right? Volunteering and contributing and and, and engaging in our church community and supporting where we can, but we're not going to be the ones to pack up and move to the other side of the globe in order to do it, because our missional call is to live right where we are and to live it out with God's glory in mind and God's power and spirit with us and with the view and understanding that it's going to be something seemingly small and insignificant but God's going to grow it into something great and use it for something powerfully good. Isn't that the point of Jesus' one parable about the kingdom being like a grain of mustard seed, right? It's so small, it's almost imperceptible. How could anything like this large plant grow out of it so large and strong that large predator birds, scavengers, could sit in its branches? Well. It's because God can take very small things and transform them into great big things for his glory and for his use and purposes. In God's economy, big things come in small packages. And so I think this could end up being a both and rather than an either or. What do you think? Give it some thought uh, as you continue through this particular week. I like this statement by Kevin DeYoung. He says in his book, Just Do Something, A Liberating Approach to Finding God's Will. He says, go marry someone, provided you're equally yoked and you actually like being with each other. Go get a job, provided it's not wicked. 
Go live somewhere in something with somebody or nobody. But put aside the passivity and the quest for complete fulfillment and the perfectionism and the preoccupation with the future. If you are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, de Young says, you will be in God's will. So just, just go out and do something. It's a great book. It really is. And I love that statement from it. There on your screen, and I'll send these slides to you, is a link to the seventh in the series of videos that we've watched a little bit from uh, called um, For the Life of the World. The last one kind of sums up the whole series and uh, highlights the church and the community of believers and how we live out the will of God in community. And so I'll leave that for you. Uh, if you use the link, you'll need to put in your username and password as a student here at Regent, and it'll take you right there. You can get to the last one. So as we kind of move into a little different segment here, let's think about service as a spiritual discipline. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Uh, in a variety of spiritual disciplines. And one of those were the community disciplines. You remember the disciplines of community, worship, right? Generosity, service, uh, in addition to uh, the disciplines of the word and uh, uh, the different disciplines of the body, mind, and spirit. Service as a spiritual discipline is rooted in scripture and modeled in the life of Christ. So I want us to consider how can we cultivate service as a spiritual discipline or habit, and then look at Jesus as a model of that. Uh, one of the most beautiful poignant scenes in the ministry of Jesus is what we call the Last Supper, where Jesus was observing the Passover feast with his 12 disciples for the very last time before his death on the cross, his burial, uh, uh, following his crucifixion. Uh, John tells us in John chapter 13 that the meal was now over and that Jesus, knowing that he had come from the Father and that he was returning to the Father and that all power belonged to him, got up from the table, took off his outer garments and put on the clothes of a house servant, took a basin of water and a towel, and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, in the time of Christ, the practice of foot washing was common. It was an act of hospitality. It was a practical service that was offered because of the mode of transportation a lot of the times being by foot, pedestrians, right? Their feet would be dirty. They would be tired and sore. And often the, the practice in the Jewish tradition of the day was for the house servant uh, or one of the women in the house to perform this service as an act of hospitality to the guests that were in the house. And so it wouldn't be surprising that the disciples would have a foot washing experience. But what's really interesting in this passage in John chapter 13 is nobody had thought to offer it to one another. Nobody had prepared for it. But what blew their minds was that Jesus did the unexpected. He was the one who washed their feet. He was the one who took the role of a servant, humbled himself, and provided hospitality and care to his disciples. And it blew them away. And Peter, who was prone to speak sometimes before he thought, probably was speaking in behalf of many of the disciples. When he came to Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing to you now, you do not understand, but after you, afterward, you will understand. Peter objected, you will never wash my feet. Well, why would he object? Why would any of them object? Well, despite the fact that none of them had ever thought that maybe they should be washing one another's feet or washing for, uh, first and foremost, the feet of Jesus as the Messiah, for them to be having their feet washed by the one that they sincerely, truly believed was the Son of God, the Messiah, that was not the role. He was the master, not the servant. 
And so it's, it's no surprise, really, when we think about it from their perspective that Peter would object. Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. In other words, hey, if this is what you want to use to indicate that I'm devoted to you, you wash my whole body, not just my feet, because I'm devoted to you. But Jesus replied, the one who has bathed, ceremonially cleansed, does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Now, that's a reference to Judas, who eventually here in the same night is going to betray Jesus. You see what Jesus does here? Jesus helps us understand service as a discipline or a spiritual practice in life. And shows us how that service upends protocol, uh, uh, rank and file, pecking order. Hierarchies is the, is the word I'm using here. Jesus reorients the disciples' understanding of leadership and service. Uh, uh, Foster, uh, who writes, uh, Richard Foster, who writes a great deal about spiritual practices and disciplines in his book, Celebration of Discipline, says, Jesus totally and completely rejecting, rejected the pecking order systems of his day. And he demonstrated that in this, in this object lesson or illustration. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 20, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So we learn from Jesus that servanthood means that this pecking order thing that we get into uh, is totally upside down, inside out in the kingdom of God. Whoever is first or desires to be first will be last. Whoever desires to be the greatest will be the least among you, is what Jesus is describing here uh, in Matthew 20. So as we think about service as a spiritual discipline, let's think about what that means for our relative place in life. It doesn't make us worth any less. Jesus did not wash feet because he thought he was less than his disciples. John points out Jesus knew exactly who he was. He had come from God. He was going to God and all authority had been given him by the Father. Everything was in his power. In fact, Jesus' self-identity and awareness is part of what fueled his willingness and ability to be a servant. Servants know who they are, who they are. Huge difference between being a servant and a doormat. No, being a servant doesn't mean we're less than. In fact, Jesus says greatness is really seen in our servanthood. Um, and as we've said uh, from Matthew, but this passage comes from Paul. It describes Jesus. It's as, it's as identity, not simply an action. Jesus was a servant. He was the son of God. He was God in the flesh. But he was a servant. He came to serve. And so Paul would say in Philippians chapter 2, speaking of Christ, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So it's not just what we do that denotes servanthood. Servants are who we are if we're following Jesus. Third, and we get back to Michael Horton and ordinary. Servanthood often comes for the follower of Christ in the ordinary events of life. So in the ministry of Jesus, we see him teaching and preaching and healing and feeding and ministering to those, to those in need. He sees people. He sees their needs. He becomes aware of them. This is the one who, in a crowd of people pressing in on him, 
was innately aware. He felt and knew in his body and spirit and mind that a woman who had a hemorrhage uh, condition uh, for many years of her life had touched his garment. And in this massive crowd, he turns around and says, who touched me? And his disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? There's all kinds of people. He saw people and he saw their needs and he saw them as opportunities to lift people up and to heal their wounds and to validate their value and personhood. John chapter six, massive crowd had come to see his miracles and to hear him teach and the day went long and the food went short and Jesus saw that they were languishing. And so he feeds them miraculously from a little sack lunch that Peter was aware or Philip was aware of in the crowd and uh, that belonged to a boy that was there because he saw them and he saw their need and he responded to it in the ordinary. Again, serving is not simply doing, but it's a way of being. It's a way of seeing the world. It's the way of seeing people, right? That's how we know the will of God for our lives. And then fourth, and this is tough for some people, being a servant of God also involves a willingness to be served at times. Go back to Peter at what we call the Last Supper. Jesus washing feet. Did you remember his initial response? No, nope, don't do it. He refused. Why do people do that? Why do people refuse to let others or are resistant to others serving them? Well, there can be a variety of reasons. Uh, it makes us feel uncomfortable. Uh, we don't want to be beholden to anybody. Maybe we feel we're not worthy to be served by someone else could be other reasons you could think of. But notice Jesus' response. If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And so sometimes we're the servant, and sometimes we have need to be served. Jesus serves our needs, and Jesus equips and gives us and calls us to serve the needs of others, which means that if others are going to exercise their gift of service, Somebody has to exercise their gift of being served. Isn't that right? So the question is, are we willing to accept the service and blessing of others? It's a reciprocal experience. We serve and we are served. And most often there's a balance to it, right? But we need to question why we would be so resistant because this is a part of what it means to be a servant to allow others to help us at times because we need that kind of support and we need that kind of help given, given back to us. Well, I've given you a video there for us to watch uh, from this series on the life of the world for the life of the world. And it has to do with this. And so I want us to see that together. Well, we're wrapping up. This is what we're doing the rest of the week. Um, once again, no in-person class tonight. Uh, here's our session, but uh, we do have our um, career management assignments to complete. Uh, we have our final exam to take. It's open now for you to take. Uh, everything is set. If you have time before the end of the week, do it. Just knock it out and be done. Um, and uh, we have a couple of videos that help set up this theme for the week. Hopefully you can, you can pay attention to those. Uh, but I'll leave you with this. We're approaching Christmas. We're talking about Jesus as a servant. We're talking about living the radical call to holiness and servanthood. We've talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer already in our course, but I love this statement as we approach the holidays. He asked, who will celebrate Christmas correctly? Whoever finally lays down all power, all honor, all reputation, all vanity, all arrogance, all individualism beside the manger. That's really what this course is all about. Helping us to know who God is, learning who we are, so that we're able to see the true, the good, and the beautiful, 
so that we can cherish the character of God, become imitators of him because we're made in his image, to challenge the world in transformational ways so that salt and light is experienced by the culture around us and that Jesus can be modeled before them. Transformation by God's spirit can be experienced. And then finally, that means that we're going to learn to serve the world. I pray that the course has been beneficial to you. It's been such a joy to me to experience these last eight weeks with you. We still have a few days left. We've got a few assignments to finish up. And so I'm nearby if needed. I'm praying for you daily. But uh, God bless you as you learn to cherish character, challenge culture, and serve the world.